children around the world grow up in conditions of severe hardship and suffering. But I wasn't one of them. <laughs> this is me at my family home in England. It's my third birthday. My personality was already emerging. First observation. Sandals and socks. <laughs> Harry high pants. And stripes on stripes. <laughs> I was never destined to be in the cool group here at Radford, <laughs> but I was getting in plenty of practice for the summer uniform. <laughs> Second observation, my brand new yellow cricket bat. Yeah. I got it that morning for my third birthday. I never wanted to let this thing out of my hands. You never get me out! I yelled at the bowler. <laughs> Strangely, it was true. The bowler was my aging grand. <laughs> she hobbled to the crease and threw gentle underarms. I smacked her all over the garden. <laughs> Look at that smug little smile. <laughs> Surprised I wasn't licking my lips. <laughs> all through my childhood, I dreamed of playing cricket for Australia. At home, I would play in the backyard, front yard, in the hallway, garage, under the clothesline. I'd play in the shower. Yep, cricket in the shower. <laughs> Canberra was in a severe drought at the time and we had compulsory water restrictions. But I said to Mum, there's cricket to be played. So me and my brother would smack the soap all over the shower. <laughs> I soon graduated from the Carter's family shower to the PNF Oval here at Radford. Before then, I'd always been told that cricket training was about hitting the ball on the ground to keep it in the nets. But here at Radford, it seemed as though the main goal was to hit the ball as hard as you could from the p and Oval up onto the PE Centre roof. <laughs> You'd act all innocent and apologise to the coach. Sorry, Daryl. <laughs> but then you get a pat on the back from the lads after training. <laughs> Fortunately, Daryl was a brilliant coach, not just a forgiving one. He helped me work hard at my game throughout my Radford years. And I went straight from my time here to a professional cricket contract with the Victorian Bush Rangers. I loved my first year playing for Victoria. I was training and playing alongside my cricketing idols. Everything I needed to improve my game was right there at my fingertips. I could feel my cricket getting better every single day. But a strange thing happened over the next few years. I began to notice that I wasn't particularly happy. I wasn't satisfied. I was living out my childhood dream, but I wasn't that child anymore. I felt the pressure of professional sport. It's a privileged profession, but it's also quite intense. Everything you do comes with a number next to your name. Every match you play, you get a score, and every day at training, you're measured in every possible way. If your numbers are good, you're celebrated, and if your numbers are bad, you get sacked. It doesn't matter if you're kind and friendly, or if you're an arrogant twat. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure this is quite familiar to you, in a way, it's just like high school. We all have ID numbers that gets, gets ranked against, uh, we get ranked against other ID numbers and everyone gets squeezed onto this standardised bell curve. The judgement and pressure make you feel sick and anxious. It's not your teacher's fault and it's not the school's fault. It's just the way our society is set up and it does a lot of bad as well as some good. I became increasingly interested in the bigger picture philosophy, economics, global inequality. Travelling with cricket through countries like India and South Africa, I met many people finding their way through incredible injustice and hardship. I saw that the world is a fundamentally unjust place. So much comes down to the lottery of birth. Meanwhile, the locker room chat consisted of golf, fishing and beer. I craved something deeper, truer friendships, better conversation and a more meaningful contribution to the world. What did a silly game of cricket matter when 100 million young people in South Asia were surviving on less than a dollar per day? Are sports people any more than pin-up boards for alcohol, gambling and fast food brands? <laughs> Still, I was highly aware of how fortunate I was to be playing sport for a living. Yes, cricket still meant a lot to me but I seem to have kept all the anxiety and pressure while losing the passion and sense of purpose. 
it seemed that I had a decision to make. <laughs> I think that many people feel something like this at some point in their lives. We feel that we either have to resign ourselves to our problems or run away dramatically, do nothing or burn everything down. Or, as I like to call them, bury your head in the sand or go full Chris McCandless. <laughs> One of my favourite films is called Into the Wild. It's the true story of Chris McCandless. He's a young man who leaves his regular life behind in search of something more real. He leaves his family and friends, donates all his savings to charity, drives into the desert, buries his licence, burns his cash, and then wanders homeless around America. Chris finds beauty and strength in his wanderings, and he meets some extraordinary people. At this point in the film, I'm ready to bury my cricket bat, burn my KFC jersey, and join him. But Chris pushes further and further away from society. Ultimately, he starves to death alone in the Alaskan wilderness. A move to New South Wales seemed like a better option. <laughs> <laughs> so I took up a contract and decided to give cricket one more year. On my way from Melbourne to Sydney, I took a small detour to Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. <laughs> it's funny where cheap fares will get you sometimes. <laughs> I was joining a canoeing expedition with two of my oldest friends. We canoed across Mongolia from Lake Hobsgol up in the northwest all the way to Siberia in the northeast. We carried with us clothes, books, two barrels of food, and a three man tent. Our days in the canoe unfolded simply and slowly, surrounded by the peaceful Mongolian steppe country. Each night we would choose a spot to camp, cook dinner on the fire, and sit around reading and chatting. This month away from society really gave me space to reflect. I felt fearless and free, thousands of miles away from any normal pressure or responsibility. Maybe there was a middle option between do nothing or go full Chris McCandless. Maybe I could find a new form of meaning. We paddled down the river with full hearts and clear minds. I felt incredibly calm, yet at the same time full of energy. How do I keep this feeling when I go back home, I asked. And this made me think a lot about fear of failure. Often in life, the thing that, that holds us back is a fear that we will fail and that people will judge us in some way for it. I believe this cripples us more than we know. I've often heard the saying, what would you try if you knew you could not fail? But maybe we need to ask, what is worth trying regardless of the outcome? What if the process of trying matters more than the outcome? And what if success exists right here in the moment of decision? What would it mean if we actually took these ideas seriously? I came home from Mongolia determined to be different. I wanted to make an impact to help young people whose upbringing was much more difficult than mine. I thought about the things I'm most grateful for and that not everyone has the chance at, and my mind came firmly to education. It's so much more than a certificate. Education Quality education can transform people's lives. It leads to self-confidence, power and autonomy. It can break the cycle of poverty in one generation. I came up with an idea. It's called Batting for Change. Partnering with the LBW Trust Charity, it's an initiative to bring together cricket-loving Australians to support the education of disadvantaged young people in developing cricket-playing nations. We aim to transform communities by empowering young people with the opportunity of a high quality education they would, not, they would not otherwise have a chance at. During the summer, we invite supporters to log onto our website, battingforchange.com.au, and make a pledge to donate a small amount of money for every six my team, the Sydney Sixers, hit in the T20 Big Bash League. I didn't know if anyone would support the idea, but the point was to give it a try. I felt like I had little to lose. In that first season of Batting for Change, we raised enough money to support the construction of three new classrooms at the Heartland School in Kathmandu, Nepal. I was amazed by the generosity of my family, friends and complete strangers. In the last two summers, we've raised over $300,000 and we now support the tertiary education 
of 1,000 young women who have grown up in poverty in India and rural Sri Lanka. As well as our Big Bash Pledge Per Six campaign, we play fundraising matches in schools across Sydney. Communities come together to support a more level playing field in global education. The young girl in the bottom of this photo is Rabina Ansari. I met Rabina when I visited her college in Mumbai last year. Rabina is one of six children. Her father died when she was very young. She loved going to school, but her family had no money to support her continued education. Thanks to Batting for Change funding, she is able to study for her Bachelor of Arts. Her dream is to one day become a lecturer in economics. A surprising thing happened that summer when I started Batting for Change. I started playing very good cricket. It was my best season ever. I was named Player of the Year in the New South Wales team that won the Sheffield Shield. I felt renewed purpose, incredible presence, and far less pressure than before. My cricket took on a new dimension. I felt happy and fulfilled. While living in Victoria, I changed in such a way that I became distant and alienated from the life I was living. When I changed my attitude to fear and strive to change the lives of others, I changed myself more than I realised. I became freer, lighter, and more present. Young women like Rubina have found new opportunities for their future, and myself and other people who have joined Batting for Change have found a new perspective on the present. But here's the thing about change, it keeps on changing. It's unfortunate that success sometimes leads us to be more conservative rather than braver. We grow pleased with our outcomes, with our numbers and comparisons, and we become anxious to preserve them. We forget that what matters is the trying. It's three years since I founded Batting for Change, and we're still changing all the time. I still feel confused by the big questions in the world and how I should be during my short time in it. The path ahead is sometimes clear, but sometimes foggy. But what I do know is that I'm extremely lucky to have had this start in life and that every young person deserves a quality education. One privilege of education is the opportunity to ask questions. And so I invite you to ask yourselves, where can you be a little bit braver? What conversations are missing from your life? And what is worth trying, regardless of the outcome?